Hello and welcome to News Center with me, Parikshit Lutra. Our focus today on the new IT rules amendments which allowed the government to set up a fact-checking unit. Now, why is this important? Well, this uh, fact-checking unit, and let's explain this in great detail, will identify fake or false or misleading online content connected to any aspect of the central government. Also, if this fact-checking unit identifies any information as false or fake, then social media intermediaries and telecom services providers must inform users not to host, display or upload that content. In case of violation, the intermediaries can lose the safe harbour immunity. This has led to concerns. The Internet Freedom Foundation, uh, they will be joining us on the programme as well, have said that the move will have a chilling effect on the right to free speech and expression. With this power, the fact-checking unit can issue takedown orders and bypass the checks and balances prescribed in Section 69A of the Information Technology Act. The Editors Guild has condemned this uh, notification, saying it is disturbed by the amendment and they deeply feel that this will impact press freedom. The news broadcasters and digital association today has said that this gives the government power to designate the fact-checking unit as the adjudicator of truth. Raji Chandrasekhar, the Minister of State for Electronics and IT, says the move is aimed solely to safeguard citizens and there are no sweeping or draconian powers. Clearly there are concerns. There is a challenge to these amendments in the Bombay High Court as well. To take all of this forward, we're joined by N. Ram, uh, director of the Hindu Publishing Group and former editor-in-chief of the Hindu, Nikhil Pava, founder of Media Nama, and Pratik Vagre, policy director at Internet Freedom Foundation, also joining us. Uh, Mr. Andram, if I can begin with you. We have seen statements from the News Broadcasters Association, the Editors Guild as well. Give us a sense of how it threatens press freedom when you have a unit which has been set up by the government that can judge what is true, what is false, and can issue takedown orders. How dangerous is this for press freedom, according to you? This is clearly censorship creep, on uh, censorship of the internet. That's what is being targeted. As the uh, Internet Freedom Foundation has repeatedly made clear, I've been reading all its, uh, what it puts out. Uh, and I think it's very clear that the, as elections, as the two, uh, 2024 Lok Sabha election nears, this uh, censorship creep has, uh, uh, has moved forward, has advanced to dangerous limits. And I'm clear that this is unconstitutional. Uh, it violates uh, 19.1a clearly. It, it goes directly against the Shreya single versus uh, judgment of the Supreme Court of India. And uh, I think they should be given short shrift. But if this is allowed, then I think news providers will also be hit. Because, you know, in an earlier draft, which came mm. out earlier, I think in February, the proposal was to include them. There was an outcry and they made a change. But, uh, you know, news providers mm. will be hit because they depend on social media platforms to scale up, to monetize and so on, to survive and to flourish. So this is an indirect way of hitting them as well, apart from uh, all the rest of the... Uh, actors involved in this. So this will be an outrageous, atrocious attack on uh, uh, free speech, freedom of the media in India. And I think we cannot allow it to pass. All right. Uh, let's get in uh, Pratik Vagre of the Internet Freedom Foundation. Pratik, uh, give us a sense of the consultation process. Do you think the stakeholders, first of all, how big was this list of stakeholders who were consulted and was the consultative period enough for a rule like this? Yeah, no, that, that, that's a great question. I think there's a consistent pattern there when it comes to consultation, but let's just talk about this, uh, this particular one, right? Uh, now, it was the initial notification for this came out on January 17th. That happened to be the deadline day of an already ongoing consultation for online gaming intermediaries. So, so, you know, so, so the type of people who'd be paying attention to that consultation would be, you know, people who are related to that industry. So it comes out on uh, January 17th uh, with a deadline of January 25th initially, right? So you effectively, to start with, had a seven, eight day consultation uh, consultation phase that was provided for it. Now, there was a lot of backlash. There was uh, significant criticism. And again, on the day of the deadline, by which, you know, you would expect most people would have already submitted their comments given uh, how, how much of an impact this has 
uh, for a range of stakeholders. Uh, it was then extended again subsequently till you know at at till some point in Feb, right? But but the point remains that you know with these sort of piecemeal extensions, uh, it made it very hard for uh, stakeholders to to engage meaningfully with the consultation process. Uh, at the time of the consultation, it was also said that you know there will be a subsequent uh, meeting with stakeholders, etc. But as we saw, you know the Editors Guild of India in their statement uh, have noted that. Uh, you know, it doesn't seem like any meaningful conversation or any consultation happened. Uh, so, so, so there are, you know, there have been constant concerns uh, on that front. Right. Uh, concerns about uh, not having an adequate consultation on a rule of this magnitude. Nikhil, if I can uh, get you in at this stage, uh, the Internet Freedom Foundation, also the uh, news broadcasters and the Digital Association, uh, they have gone on to say that this bypasses the checks and balances in the IT Act. How does that do this? Uh, what kind of powers will the government get this, get through this fact-checking unit now? So, so Parikshit, I think we should be clear. What this allows the government to do is fact-check, uh, which is an irony because effectively the media is supposed to fact-check the government. In this case, the government can choose to fact-check, let's say, uh, articles from the Hindu uh, which are on social media and say that and tell social media platforms to take it down. So what that does is directly it impacts the reach of the article online. It uh, impacts the persistence online. They can even ask Google to take it off their search links, which means that, you know, there used to be <clears throat> if a tree falls in a forest and nobody heard it, did it fall, right? So that, that same, if it's not visible, it doesn't exist uh, online. So that's the power that the government gets with this. But this is just one of the many steps that the government has taken since September 2020 to reduce media freedom, especially for digital media. So firstly, in September 2020, they imposed 50 percent, they imposed FTI restrictions on digital media, which led to the shutting down of Huffington Post in India, which left, uh, led to Yahoo News leaving India. Uh, then uh, in, in, uh, they came out with the IT rules. Um, and what those rules initially did was that they brought digital media under a registration mechanism and also brought them under the purview of Section 69A, which would allow, for example, the government, a government committee to issue an order uh, uh, to, to any news organization to censor an article. So the sen direct censorship power already existed because of the IT rules. Subsequently, some news organizations like Live Law went to court and got a stay order there, which is why we're not seeing the orders. These new rules look like a mechanism to bypass that as well. Not just the, not just the share single judgment, not just, um, you know, uh, they're, they're bypassing these IT rules. The, and, and I know the minister said that, you know, this is just safe harbor, uh, that if the social media platforms don't take it down, they'll just lose safe harbor. They're not going to be, that, what that means is that they could become liable for the content. And what we saw in 2013-14, before Shreya Single, was that platforms used to willingly censor content on the basis of a written, pure written complaint from any individual because they didn't want the liability. No platform will survive the liability uh, and will take the risk of, of, of mm. going against a government order. We saw what happened with Twitter, right? And uh, they were mm. being threatened with losing their safe harbor protections right. as well. So across social media, news media, mm. There are mechanisms being put into place to... Nikhil? ...platform to censor content. Nikhil, we... Right, Nikhil, very quickly, if I can just add one question before going to Mr. N. Ram. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there clarity so far with these new IT rules on the fact-checking <laughs> unit whether there is any option of appeal against an order from this FCU, uh, any option of hearing before any content has to be taken down? What is the recourse that one has or can or will one only have to go to the High Court or the Supreme Court or uh, or any uh, Sessions Court for that matter? Look, I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding is that there is no appeals process over here. But let's not forget that the IT Act itself does not allow the government to make such rules. In fact, they don't even allow the government to bring the news media under regulation. So these rules are effectively ultra virus of the IT Act and therefore uh, they're unconstitutional. But what we're seeing is that since 2020, for, you know, with multiple iterations of the IT rules, the government has bypassed parliament, bypassed the IT Act. These are all 
illegal rules that have been allowed to get created. And we're seeing more and more, like even with the gaming part of these regulations, the government has no basis to regulate games using these IT rules. So if we keep allow, if, if the courts, if parliament keeps al allowing the government to get away with creating illegal rules, this is only going to increase. What the government is now seeking to do is, in, is my understanding, right. is that once the, once the Digital India Act comes in, it will legitimize all of these rules. Mm. <coughs> what we're seeing is that the rules mm. are actually preceding the law now. So the intention of the government with what it wants with the Digital India Act is right. very clear. If you look at all the rules that have come out along with the IT Act, and therefore these rules are illegal. Mm. Right. Uh, and is that the worrying part, Mr. Enram, the, the vagueness of the rules itself? Because that gives an overreaching power to the government to do whatever it needs in a situation when it feels that some content on a social media handle or on a news website is uh, not conducive to the government view? It's not just the uh, vagueness that, is, uh, that should bother us. It's the whole project. It's the whole project of the government being prosecutor and judge, as uh, as the Kunal Kamra uh, petition, excellently drafted petition, I read it uh, on the website of the Internet Freedom Foundation, uh, points out. Uh, it, it goes against the principles of natural justice. It violates uh, Section 793B of the Information Technology Act of, of 2000. It, uh, it, it, it uh, flies in the face of 191A and also infringes uh, Article 14. And these are the things that will surely come up in the courts. I'm glad that uh, uh, Kunal Kamra has, uh, has uh, promptly gone, taken it up with an excellent, uh, excellently drafted petition before the Bombay High Court. And I think uh, it's a project, mm. not just the vagueness uh, that should bother us. A clear attempt at censorship, take right. down uh, Mr. instance of the court. Mr. Enram, do you also feel that, uh, of course, we're seeing one challenge that has come via a petition filed by Kunal Kamra in the Bombay High Court, but the government could potentially be opening itself to extensive litigation because there will be so many people, so many social media platforms, intermediaries, news websites, if this fact-checking unit becomes active, who may want to approach court. So potentially this could open up to a lot of litigation as well. Yes, I, I, I'm aware that uh, quite a few organizations are getting ready. Uh, uh, their lawyers are at work, and I think they want to go to the Supreme Court, so this is going to be finally heard in the Supreme Court. Surely it'll be transferred. But meanwhile, if, if, if it takes time, I'm sure the Bombay High Court will, uh, will act decisively in this matter because uh, the initial, you know, uh, when it was mentioned, I think uh, it was clear that it's a very serious matter. Yes, uh, litigation there, there will right. be, and uh, sure, what we want is an immediate stay of this, because it will take time to go through all the issues. An immediate stay in the Supreme Court of India. An immediate stay is... Uh, right, so an immediate stay is what you're seeking, what Kunal Kamra is seeking, uh, and let's see what happens in other courts. Uh, but Nikhil, uh, I know you want to come in. I'll quickly get in Pratik. Uh, he has been waiting by before I come to you. Uh, Pratik... Very quickly, when it comes to social media intermediaries, the laws, the rules governing them have been changing. As Nikhil pointed out, it will further change with the Digital India Act. Uh, do you think this, this new law, this new rule on a fact-checking unit is something that social media companies would like to question? Uh, is there a precedent globally of an FCU of this kind that has been set up by any government? Uh, that, uh, you know, there isn't, uh, certainly not from any country that we may want to emulate. Uh, look, and, and you know, typically the, the tra trajectory with any sort of anti-disinformation or anti-fake news legislation, which may not be in the same form, but, uh, you know, in, in similar form, uh, what what, it, what tends to happen is that it's, you know, it's weaponized, it's selectively enforced, and it's weaponized against uh, folks in the opposition, against dissenting voices, uh, and you know, leading to the overall criminalization of information altogether, right? So, so while it's while it's introduced in the pretext on under the pretext of uh, trying to be uh, trying to solve the disinformation problem, it invariably is used to criminalize information that is inconvenient uh, for for the authorities, right? That's 
uh, that that's the way they 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 tend to they tend to pan out. Right, uh, Nikhil Baba, you wanted to come in. Yeah, but Parikshit, I think let's not forget that social media companies in the past have also failed to challenge the earlier versions of the IT rules, which actually uh, instituted criminal liability for one of their employees, a chief compliance officer. Also, streaming services, which were also brought under these uh, the initial IT rules, which are also not legal, they also failed to challenge. <laughs> the only entities that have actually challenged the rules uh, are WhatsApp, because protecting privacy in end -to -end encryption was an existential uh, situation for them. And digital news organizations like LiveLaw, uh, which also went to court to challenge. So two parts of the rules have already been stayed. But I don't expect social media intermediaries to be bold enough to go and challenge the government and the courts. It's contingent on, on, on organizations like the Internet Freedom Foundation, like other news organizations to go and challenge these rules. But the role of parliament is also important here. These rules are bypassing parliament. My question is, what's happening there? Why isn't the, the fact that the government is making rules that the laws don't allow, why aren't we seeing that being acted upon by parliament? Hmm. Right. Uh, possibly this is something that the Parliamentary Committee on Information Technology and Communications may take up. Uh, so let's uh, wait and see what happens on that front and what happens in the monsoon session. We're going to take a short break, but we request Mr. N. Ram, Nikhil Baba, Prateek Vagre to stay on with us. Uh, this discussion continues on the other side after a short break. Welcome back. We are in conversation with N. Ram, director of the Hindu Publishing Group and former editor-in-chief of The Hindu, Nikhil Pava, founder of Media Nama, Pratik Vagre, policy director at Internet Freedom Foundation. Uh, Pratik, uh, let me begin this segment with you. Uh, yes, this is an issue that will now play out in courts. The Bombay High Court has sought a reply from the Ministry of Electronics and IT uh, in a week's time. But what are some of the issues that are likely to crop up in court. I know uh, you don't want to offer a legal perspective, but from a practitioner's perspective, from the view of Internet Freedom Foundation, which are some of the key issues that uh, you would like to be brought up before the courts? Thank you. I, you know, I, I want to maybe take that a little differently, right? And let's uh, maybe look at, uh, from a real-world perspective, what, what, what will play out. Uh, because you know, as as the rules sort of uh, as, as they are worded, as they are phrased, uh, you know, being very ambiguous, you can't, uh, you know, it, it's really hard to define, or you know, the rules don't really define what fake, false, or uh, or misleading is. Uh, it is at this point really unclear to you know to 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 anyone how these rules will be interpret interpreted by intermediaries. What type of content uh, you know they will they will take action. Uh, on or against, right? When when a fact check is is issued, so what does that mean for people, right? What does that mean for uh, you know for people who depend on the internet for their livelihood? What does that mean for voices who rely on the internet to get uh, their mes message out? Uh, none of that is is clear at this point, right? So you know when this happens, does that or does that mean that uh, you know someone like like a Twitter or Facebook will immediately comply and take down? Uh, take take down a link, right? Uh, will ISPs be expected to to stop hosting websites? Will DNS services be expected to stop resolving DNS queries? None of that is is, is clear at this stage, right? Will will WhatsApp be expected to take down links, right? As we, as as Nikhil sort pointed out, uh, what you know, what does that mean for end to end encryption? So there are a lot of these uh, issues that are going to you know that, that are going to play a part. Uh, that is that is unknown at this stage, and because you know this uh, amendment seems to have been. Uh, put out without, you know, without adequate thought, without adequate consideration, potentially with the, with the, you know, as uh, as, as Mr. Ram pointed out, with with the, with the project to control, uh, you know, to control media, which is a larger larger trend we've seen across, you know, other forms of legislation as well, whether it's the telecommunications bill, whether it's the data protection bill, a uh, lot of it is point, you know, tending towards greater amounts of control for the ex executive and more discretion in terms of the type of things they can do or choose to act uh, to choose, choose to act against right so now all of these may or may not uh, may or may not come up in court but you know as as citizen as a civil society organization we're concerned about a lot of these right uh, nikhil are you uh, do you have any clarity in terms of who will be a part of this fact checking unit uh, how big will this body be how will it function what will be the procedure it will uh, follow 
Do you think the government uh, must come clear on each of these aspects? No, I don't think so. I think the government should scrap these rules. Why should there be a body in the first place? Uh, these rules, like I said, are illegal. Mm -hmm. uh, multiple rules under the ITI that have been formed since 2020 are illegal. We need to have, I mean, where is the, uh, what is the point of having laws and rules and, and processes in parliament if you're going to keep bypassing them? But, you know, let's, do, let's look at fake news as a trope. Mm. The first time we started hearing a minister talking about fake news was after Cambridge Analytica. And uh, at that point in time, Ravi Shankar Prasad mm. kept raising it. They kept building this narrative. They kept calling WhatsApp CEO to India repeatedly to try and, and tell them that WhatsApp needs to do something about fake news. Eventually, before the 2019 elections, WhatsApp did make some product-level changes, but they did not bypass end-to-end -end encryption. They didn't roll back on end-to-end -end encryption, which allows our conversations on WhatsApp to be private and safe. Um, what has happened since then is that the IT rules that were passed, they used fake news as, uh, as a reason for bypassing end-to-end -end encryption, saying that WhatsApp must determine the originator of that message, which means that you're using fake news as a trope to basically break privacy on WhatsApp. In the same vein, here, fake news is basically being used to censor the reach of news media, which might be critical of the government. So fake news is a, is a narrative that we've been seen building up since 2017, 18, 19. Over a period of time, it's being used as an excuse to basically censor our freedoms, whether it is privacy or it is freedom of expression. Right. My final question to Mr. N. Ram. Uh, Mr. Ram, this notification essentially gives the information dissemination arm of the government the power to decide what is fake, what is false, what is misleading. Uh, to what extent were news organizations like yours consulted before this was notified? Did you know that this kind of a rule was coming and in this form? No, no. They were certainly not consulted. And I read a report where they said it's an oversight that they didn't consult them on this chain. I don't know if that's correct, but I read that report. But certainly, we, we, the Hindu was not consulted, nor any organization, any media organization I know about. Uh, but um, this is completely unacceptable. Uh, were we surprised? Uh, there was an attempt earlier, there was a proposal where the Press Information Bureau was going to do it. They already have a so called fact check uh, unit or fact check function but uh, it goes against every principle of uh, fact checking if you look at the international fact checking uh, networks code of principles the first principle is the commitment to non partisanship and fairness second commitment commitment to standards and transparency of sources third a commitment to transparency and funding uh, and organize uh, transparency of funding and organization fourth principle a commitment to standards and transparency of, of methodology. Five, a commitment to an open and honest corrections policy. So if PIB does a fact check, forget that it comes under this rule. Any kind of fact check that it puts out, <laughs> out there, uh, is it going to fulfill any, meet any of these principles other than the fact that the funding comes from uh, the government? Uh, will it correct... Uh, its own uh, fact, uh, you know, fact checks if they are if they are uh, false. Uh, on another point, I just want to flag it. There may not be enough time to discuss it in any detail here. Is the terms uh, false, fake, and misleading are meaningless. False, of course, uh, you know, what uh, there are arguments about the truth, about what facts, and so on. And honest mistakes should be protected and under, under free speech if they're honest. But the point I'm going to make is there is a world of difference between misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation is not deliberate. It's not motivated. It happens all the time, and it, it is capable of being corrected. Disinformation is a completely different animal. It's deliberate. It's motivated. It's scaled up, and its toxicity is enormous. It harms lives. It takes lives. It mm. harms uh, health and uh, politics and so on. So I think th th there's no distinction here between misinformation and disinformation. Mm. And you know the kind of hate speech that abounds on, uh, mm. on, the, on the digital platforms. 
Uh, some people are, I think a reference was made to it, selective targeting, one-sided targeting. Some hate speech is allowed, but uh, others are uh, targeted. Uh, so I think this is the whole project. It's right. uh, harmful, it's toxic, it's anti-democratic. But most important for us here, it seems to be, it, it is clearly anti-constitutional. And uh, I do expect that this will be given short right. shrift. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. N. Ram, Pratik Vagre and uh, Nikhil Pava for joining us on this discussion. Let's see how this plays out in the Bombay High Court. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of News Centre. Thank you for watching. The news continues on the other side.